Before we get started, a little bit of orientation so that you can understand what you're looking at. I hope everybody can see. This is a one-tenth scale model of, of the city of Jerusalem, and it is this, this museum is the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Okay? And it's a really dramatic model. It's, it's wonderful. So you can get a sense of the scale by the people up above. But try to ignore those folks because what I want us to center on is what's happening right here. Now, this model is first century Jerusalem, and this stuff here did not exist at the time of Jesus. Okay, so just sort of take that out of your take that out of your imagination. That's a later first century addition to the city. But rather, at the time of Jesus, this is the city wall, the exterior of the city wall, and you can get a sense of how dramatically humongous, okay, the Temple Mount is and was. Uh, if you were to look at the Temple Mount today in Jerusalem, which dominates the city skyline, I'll show you a picture next week if you'd like, but you've all seen it. Really, all you see is about this much of the wall, okay? And it still dominates the skyline. You see where, see where I'm going? You want to see that much of the wall? And also, just if you use your imaginations, the temple itself was a wonderful oddity. It was, it was twice the height of the current Dome of the Rock stands today. Okay, so as dramatic as the Dome of the Rock may be, as it lords over the city of Jerusalem, the temple was twice that height. Its, its architect, uh, King Herod, knew about the power of, of architecture to inspire. Okay, so here's the Temple Mount, and here's the temple. I want you to remember that first century Hebrew people believed that this is the house where God lived. Okay, it wasn't just a big church. They believed that God lived in this house. Now, we're looking, we're looking at the Temple Mount from the west, and so on the eastern wall there, you see, the, you see those little columns, the little colonnade, okay? That's within the temple, uh, the temple structure itself of the courtyard. That's called Solomon's Portico. That's going to be an important part of the story, an important area. Uh, we'll come back again and again. Solomon's Portico to the east. This is the Antonia Fortress, which is the Roman garrison there. And the Romans are stationed there to make sure that there's no trouble ever. Okay, so I think that gives us enough architecture. I might think of something else, except for one more important detail. See this little bump? It's a little rock. It's a place called Skull Hill. Okay, Golgotha. This is where we believe Jesus was crucified. Now, why this absolutely blows me away. Notice how close the two are. Jesus was looking at the temple on the day he was crucified. I was always raised with the, with the hymn, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, right? But the hill wasn't far away at all. Skull Hill was right outside the city gate and looking at the temple itself. And it was perilously close. All right, so now you've got a little bit of an orientation of first century Jerusalem. And now I want to tell you a story. And it's a story that begins with a murder. Begins with a murder. Okay? In the year 34, a man named Stephanos, Stephan, all we know as Stephen, was murdered outside the city walls somewhere in Jerusalem. Murdered. Now let me tell you a story because there are a couple of key points about the life of Stephan. Stephan uh, was, was a convert. And this is a very, very key point that we're going to build on in class to class, but Stephan was a convert to what would later be called Christianity, although they didn't have a name for it yet. Stephan heard Peter and his friends preaching in Solomon's portico on the, in the eastern colonnade of the Temple Mount. Okay? He heard them, but he had never met Jesus before. This is an absolute key point. He heard them and he watched them live a life that was different than their neighbors. They shared everything in common. They healed they prayed, they sang, they took care of each other, and they told stories of the rabbi they followed, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who had been killed a year before on Skull Hill. Only they had an amazing proclamation. What they said was that, that this man, Jesus, didn't remain dead. What they said was that three days later, his tomb was found empty, and he was proved to the, to be the Messiah of God. They were Jews who preached that the long dream of Israel had been fulfilled somehow in this carpenter from Nazareth, and Stephan was converted. Now, if his conversion was the first key point, because I want you to remember that Stephan did not, did not know Jesus personally. He, did, he wasn't in Capernaum to see a miracle. He, didn't, he wasn't there for the feeding of the 5,000. He didn't see the little girl raised from the dead. He only heard the stories 
told by Peter and his friends. Okay, But Stephan watched how they lived and he decided that he wanted to join them. That's our first key point. The second key point that I want to make this morning is that Stephan was not from here. He was not from here. He wasn't from Jerusalem. He wasn't even from Palestine. Stephan, Stephanos had a Greek name. Stephan was from the provinces. He was from what we call the Roman Empire. He was from another place. He was Jewish, but he had traveled to Jerusalem for worship because this is the place where all Jewish people believed in the first century that God lived here. And so you had to return there from time to time in order to worship God in person. All right, two things I want us to remember. Okay, you note takers out there. One, Stephanos, Stephan was converted. Two, Stephan was not from here. Stephan was obviously a smart guy. He bought in. He believed what Peter and his friends said, and he, he believed the message. He knew Scripture well enough to begin to connect dots, and he even went on Sabbaths uh, to one of the synagogues within the city walls. There was a, a place called the Synagogue of the Freedmen. Back up and tell you that this is an easy story to read and an easy story to find. is Acts chapters 6 through 8 in your New Testament. Okay, Acts 6 through 8 goes to a synagogue called the Synagogue of the Freedmen, which is a synagogue for people like Stephan who were from somewhere else. It begins to preach to them, connecting the dots, showing that the Scriptures are fulfilled in this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who was killed on Skull Hill but didn't remain dead. Well, the people in the synagogue of the freedmen were so alarmed by Stephan's new message that they turned him into the same council that had killed Jesus the year before. Now, we remember the stories from our Gospels, right? Jesus' trial was a hurry-up thing. It was held under cover of night. And it was held in collusion with the Romans in the Antonia Fortress so that the Romans could take him to Skull Hill, which was a place of public executions, and kill him on that darkest Friday in the world, right? Okay, but We know that story. What we might not know is that Stephanos was taken to a show trial. They had a, I'll show you next week, but they had a room right off the temple here that was sort of half in the courtyard so that bystanders could watch and half within the temple precincts where only Jewish people could go. And so the Sanhedrin, which would be the Jewish council, the same council that killed Jesus, although under cover of night, had Stephan on trial for his life right here in the shadow of the temple house of God. Okay. Read Acts chapter 7. Stephan mounts an amazing defense. He preaches like his life depends on it. He explains to the Sanhedrin from the very beginning of the Old Testament how everything points to Jesus. And he has them in a rage. These people are religious leaders who are dependent upon Rome. These people have worked hard for their status. They are highly educated. These people, these people have a, a, a whole world that can be set on fire with this subversive message of Peter and his friends as they are beginning to convert even provincials. And we're told in the book of Acts that these men with everything to lose in terms of their power have set their teeth on edge to the whole speech. Oh, Stephan's good. But then he takes one step in the minds of the Jewish Sanhedrin. He takes one step too far. He looks at this guy and he says, I even see him. I even see him right here, right now. I see Jesus Christ alive and standing at the right hand of God. This is too much for the Jewish Sanhedrin. For these people, this is blasphemy. For these people who spent a lifetime studying the law and balancing their religion with the power of Rome, they can't stand this anymore. To claim that this man who was killed on Skull Hill is now standing on the right side of God himself is a death sentence. They don't wait for the Romans. Okay? If this was a show trial, the death is a shame. They don't wait for the Romans. They don't wait for due process, but rather... A mob drags him somewhere outside the city walls and they kill him with rocks. Now, we don't know exactly where. There are traditions that have Stephan dragged outside on the far side of the Temple Mount, which would be the Kidron Valley today. But Acts, the book of Acts doesn't tell us that. And oftentimes, places in the Middle East, churches arise in places where the, where the property was just simply available for it. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre right now sits over the rock it was called Skull Hill, and it takes up so much real estate that honestly, later pilgrims, uh, they, they didn't have room to build a church there, so I, we, no one can really say for sure. But it is no stretch for me to imagine that they drug Stefan outside this gate here to the place where people were executed. 
It's no stretch for me to imagine that at any day off the Temple Mount they could see the crows and the vultures wheeling over the bodies around Skull Hill. This seems to be the place where they would kill him. So for the purpose of our imagination, maybe we have all we need for our picture. They couldn't stand it. They called it blasphemy. They had in their law in the first century at least the ability to kill someone on the charge of blasphemy. And so a, a crowd drags them out and they execute them on the spot with rocks. In the crowd, there's a temple policeman. He's a Pharisee, a man with a career on the rise. And he's watching the coats of those who are killing Stephan. And he stands there guarding the coats. Coats are very valuable uh, objects, especially if you travel to the Middle East where the sun is so bright. A cloak very, very simply keeps you alive in, in addition to being the thing in which you carry your stuff. Okay? But he's watching the cloaks while these men pelt Stephan with rocks and he's watching the whole thing and he's haunted by it. We're told this in the book of Acts. His name was Saul. Okay, remember our two key points. Stephan was a convert, and Stephan was not from here. Neither was Saul. Saul had another name, Paulus. He was a Roman, a Roman citizen, as a matter of fact. So Stephan and Paulus were two individuals brought together okay, in the most tragic of circumstances, and they shared this key point. They were not from here. And yet, what happens on this day would change the world. Paulus and Stephan were Jewish people from the provinces. Now, it takes too long for me to tell it this morning, but let me tell you a little bit about, about where they came from and why this is important. Some five centuries before this day, five centuries before Jesus came to Jerusalem and met his death, five centuries before this temple was built, five centuries before Jerusalem was the center of their world, uh, at a time when another temple, not as grand, sat on the hill, the Babylonians okay, overran the children of Israel, overran their city, sacked to Jerusalem, and removed their best and brightest far away into the land of Babylon. That was the policy of the Babylonian king. About 80 years later, they were allowed to return home, but many stayed in Babylon. And then through a succession of leaders and wars, then came the Persians, then came the Greeks, then came their puppet rulers, then came the Romans, until five centuries later, to the time of Jesus, the Jews had been almost a subject people throughout. They had also become dispersed into the land which would then be known as the known world. There were six million Jewish people living outside of Jerusalem okay, at the time of Jesus. And that includes Stephan and Paul's. Now, there are two things that a, that a Jewish person living in the provinces could do. We can see it from their own scriptures. The first thing they could do is they could yearn. Psalm 137, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Linda Ronstadt didn't write that. Okay? It, was, it was the song. How could we sing the Lord's song in the fallen land? All right? So that was one thing that they could do. They could yearn for it. Wish they lived there. Dream of it. Maybe travel there on vacation. Uh, well, literally, the temple was, was the prime travel spot in the Roman Empire. People just wanted to see it. No one had ever seen anything that high before. Okay? The other thing that, that Jewish people living in the provinces could do is they could follow the advice of the prophet Jeremiah. They could build. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles to whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. They had two choices, to yearn or to build. <coughs> Paulus, Stephanos, they built. They were not from here. I'm going to use this image to get us thinking about Paulus throughout the class, but we really don't know what Paul looked like. This is actually a bust from the Massachusetts, uh, excuse me, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts. 
It's from their antiquities collection. And I think he's a handsome fellow and he reminds me of what the people might have looked like, what Paulus might have looked like uh, in the Roman world. So we'll use him uh, as an icon, if you will, uh, for the man who watched Stephan's murder. Now, if Stephan were not from here and were a convert, Paulus was not a convert yet. As a matter of fact, Paulus was like many Roman citizens in the day. He just blended in. He was from a city called Tarsus, which was a, a, a wealthy city and a wealthy place. And we think that Paul had his own money. That's another key point that we're going to study as we continue the world of Paul. Paulus had his own money. And like many Roman citizens, he just blended in. With a few key exceptions, Jewish people living in the provinces were exempt from military service because they kept the Sabbath. And that could be mighty inconvenient when an army was on the move. Not eating pork was a big deal in the Roman world. If, if you don't have a lot of meat and pork is all that's around, they didn't eat it. They also didn't eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols in their cities. Living in a very pagan world, that was also common. So Jewish people kept themselves apart. They, they, they rested on the seventh day. And they, they didn't eat certain foods. And then finally, there was the thing for the men, the circumcision. I mean, I make no jokes about this. Greco-Roman men were appalled that Jewish people put themselves in, in, under this kind of under this kind of uh, knife. <laughs> uh, first, for starters, it made you look different in the bathhouses. All right, and it, and it's and I'm absolutely serious about this. They were they were horrified by the concept, and this will become an issue later on as the gospel travels into the world. But that's a story for another day. Paulus like other Jewish people living in the provinces, blended in, did the best he could, except that Paulus was committed in one key way. Remember, I told you his job. He was a member of the temple police. He was a Pharisee on the rise. It's important to remember that Paulus was not only a Roman, but he was a Pharisee. Pharisees. Okay, Pharisees in Jesus' time, we, we, we often paint these with a the broad brush and we tend to think that Pharisees were merely enemies of Jesus. That's not really, that's too easy. If you read Luke's Gospel, for instance, carefully, you will see that Jesus ate in the homes of Pharisees, which means that he honored them and they honored him with their status. Meals conferred status in those days. Now, Pharisees had an important role. Pharisees uh, were entrusted by the Jewish people to not only keep the law, the law, which they believed was given by God so that they could live in rightness with Him, but they were also charged to keep them different from the Romans or whoever might be their overlord at the time. Jewish people desperately wanted to remain apart and other so that God would love them and so that God would know them when He returned one day. Right? So Pharisees had an important role. You could say the Pharisees did three things. Okay? Pharisees did three things. One, they had to be smart. You didn't you didn't have a dumb Pharisee. Okay, you couldn't, you couldn't have one. We all know dumb preachers. Okay, but we don't, you couldn't have a dumb Pharisee. Uh, and you couldn't, and, and they had to, uh, had to be scribes, which means that they had to study the law and they had to read it in Hebrew. This, this will be key for Paulus, where most of the world read Greek. If they read it all, Peter read at least two languages both Greek and Hebrew, and he could read the scriptures in their original language. And third, they had to be able to teach it to debate, okay? But something happened on the day that Paulus watched Stephan die. And you can see it tantalizingly throughout the writings of Paul. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.20, uh, what you have here is, a, is sort of a, a, a questioning, if you are wondering, of his own role as a Pharisee. Paulus said, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God made foolish, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? See, Paulus, Paulus went into the world with a change. He went into the world with a new message. He went into the world with something that he called the foolishness of God, and he changed it. Paulus set the world on fire. You know, these days I've been playing with the idea of inventions that change the world, inventions that set the world on fire. Earlier this year, I learned something about the vacuum tube that I'd never known before. Now, and the vacuum tube is an invention that set the world on fire. Did you know this? The vacuum tube. Vacuum tube uh, was, I'm going to use the vacuum tube as an analogy for Paul's message, okay? Just so you know where I'm going, all right? So the vacuum tube was invented around 1910, okay? And it looks like a light bulb. 
But where a light bulb uses a vacuum to magnify light particles, a, a vacuum tube uses a vacuum to magnify sound particles. And the reason why I changed the world is because you can put a vacuum tube in an amplifier and music before the vacuum tube, you had to have a big band in order to fill a room. After the vacuum tube, all you need is an electric guitar with a hookup, okay, and an amplifier, and one guitar can fill the room with sound. Okay, that's a world-changing, it's a world-changing invention. But wait, there's more. <laughs> it's like a Gibson knife. I have more, I have more, more. Okay, so, so, so here's how the vacuum tube changed the world. This particular instrument, the electric guitar, was, was, was particularly apt in a certain kind of music. Blues musicians from places like the Mississippi Delta loved the electric guitar because it only took one instrument. It was a cheap way to make a lot of sound, okay? And they made wonderful music, except they made this music in mid 20th century America, and that was segregated America. So a lot of people didn't hear it. Most people didn't hear it or even care about it. So it was an art form that was hidden from most of America with a few crossover artists like Elvis or maybe Jerry Lee Lewis. Other than that, people did not hear this amazing music that was made possible by the vacuum tube. Now, in Great Britain, unsegregated Great Britain, okay, young people were listening to this new music and they were creating this new music, this blues music, they were covering this blues music and they were making a lot of money on this blues music. February 9th, 1964, what happened? Remember? Beatles. Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, exactly. You know why you do that? 45% of the American public watched the Beatles sing, right? And then later that year, the Rolling Stones came over. In his, in his autobiography, uh, Alive, Keith Richards says that, um, that, that one, of his, one of his goals was to go to Chess Records in Chicago to meet Muddy Waters, his hero, a blues musician, on whom he had already made a million dollars and he met Muddy at Chess Records. Anybody ever read the book? You know where he was? Where, where Muddy was? What he was doing that day? Wearing coveralls and painting the ceiling. All right? Okay, Keith Richards couldn't believe it, but what the British invasion did is it brought an art form that we couldn't have heard in segregated America to us in new ways. The vacuum tube changed the world. Now, this isn't the only way that the world was changed. There were also places where people came together because of the vacuum tube in ways that had never happened before. And this is absolutely an analogy for the way that St. Paul changed the world. I want to tell you about one of those. It was Muscle Shoals. Anybody here seen the uh, uh, documentary on Muscle Shoals yet? A lot of you have seen it? Okay. If you like music, you'll want to see this. I want to show you the trailer for a documentary on Muscle Shoals, but what I'm going to ask you to do is to use your imaginations because this trailer is not just about music. It could easily be about Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Just watch with me for a second. What is it about Muscle Shoals? It's just a little village on the Alabama border. Why does that music come out of that? At different points in time on this planet, there are certain places where there is a field of energy. Sitting in that studio, we just fire the group. It doesn't happen very often. It's usually somebody like Rick Hall with the drive and the, and the foresight to do it. I wanted to be special. I wanted to be somebody. I remember when Bob Salmon called Stax Records, talked to Al Bell. He said, Hey man, I want those same black players that played on I'll Take You there. He says, that can happen, but these guys are mighty pale. We started to explode. The world was coming to Muscle Shoals. You thought you had to find a good girl. I stay inside. I love you all and sweet home. Being there does inspire you to do it slightly differently. It's like when they come in, you know, you're stuck. It was really funky, you know, that was the whole idea of it. I began to tell him of this great new deal we made with Capital. One of the guys stopped me and said, we've already made a deal with Jerry, we'll be leaving here. It was war. You're gonna hear some of the greatest voices that ever were. Isn't that 
fun. Now, what's amazing about this, you've got black and white, you've got all these artists from all over the country, you've, you've got this amazing music uh, coming together, and, and who knew that so much of it uh, came through Muscle Shoals? Well, the same thing happens uh, in, in the world of Paul. And yes, by the way, I'm going to try to include Keith Richards in every lesson. All right, so just, just, just know that. Uh, I'll, I'll work on it next week. Um, Wait, wait, I couldn't hear you. What was that? Special with Keith with um, the Stones playing with Muddy Water and with Chicago. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it, but it's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, you know, it's really cool. Brought together, you know, brought together in ways uh, that it that it never, you know, that it never ever happened before. Okay. So Saint Paul was a man um, haunted. Uh, Saint Paul was a man uh, who watched uh, Stefan die. Uh, St. Paul was uh, a Pharisee and a Roman citizen. St. Paul, we will see, was the man of the hour. Right? Now, what, I, I need to go back for a minute and just talk about context when we read the Bible. And when we read the letters of Paul and when we read uh, the stories of Jesus, they're just different. I wish we didn't have to have a class like this. I told my Bible studies this last week, I wish we could just sit down with a cup of coffee and open our Bibles and just understand everything that we read because it's so clear to us. I mean, is it just me? I mean, is that right? You know, sometimes you'll read something in, in the backs of your Bible and you think, what is this about? What is Paul talking about? Does he, does, why do women have to wear hats? You know, <laughs> or something, something really odd like that. And, and we, what we have to do is we have to have a class like this so that we can learn the mind of Paul, we can learn what he's saying, and we can learn what people are worried about. But one of the things that's going to help you understand the Bible right off the bat is to understand this context. Paul was a city guy. Okay? This is very important. Now, he was not from Jerusalem. He was from the provinces. And he was a city man. Now again, if you could read the original language uh, of Paul, you would find tantalizing evidence of this. I'm just going to show you one. In his second letter to the Corinthians, uh, he was describing all the bad things that would happen to him, just like the things that happened for Stephon, okay, what happened for Paulus. And so he, he wrote, uh, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, and danger from hunger. He keeps going on and on. Danger, 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 okay? If you were to look at the... Um, uh, uh, original language, this word he uses for wilderness is very telling for Paul. It's, it's an intentional word. I'll show you. Uh, in the Gospels, the word for wilderness is Chora, okay, which is the productive countryside of Jesus. It's the hills and the valleys. It's the land of shepherds and farmers. It's the land of rocks and fields and lakes and beauty. It's the land of vineyards, okay? Uh, but for Paul, he has none of this, okay? If you ain't in the city, you're in the wilderness, which for him is a remia, which means nothing. Okay? In other words, St. Paul, he ain't interested in the countryside. He's not interested in country people. Now, fortunately, in the Roman world for Paul, you had good roads and, and trading places. You had cities everywhere. And so for a man like Paul, who had a family business, okay, and who traveled, this would be very important. St. Paul was such a city guy, he was a little like that famous New Yorker cartoon. You remember this one from 1976? This is the mind of a New Yorker. Beyond the Hudson River, on the west side, there is nothing. Okay, right? And I, and I, have, a, I have a personal uh, appreciation for this because a lot of y'all know I have a summer community of chapel in Maine. I'm a minister of Maine for one month of the year. A lot of these people from New York City, and they are so unaware. This is such the mind of a New Yorker, okay? They're so unaware. And I remember years ago when Katrina hit, in 2005, I got a spate of worried calls and emails from my New Yorker and my Boston congregants who thought that Birmingham was on the sea. Okay, now, right? I mean, I mean this is easy to find out, guys, right? But, 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 but why bother, right? When it's nothing outside of the city, okay? So St. Paul, St. Paul even refers to the wilderness this way. It's, it's nothingness, okay? Uh, another thing you need to remember is we don't have a lot of money in St. Luke's, and I drew that map, okay? Uh, so uh, just, just know that, first of all. Uh, no, this is, this is the world of Jesus. This is the world of the Gospels. And just for, for context, let me, let me tell you, this is how Jericho Road got started, the whole Jericho Road story, got started with the smallness of Palestine. 
Uh, the distance, this is the Sea of Galilee. I knew, you, I knew you could tell this. This is the Sea of Galilee. And that little dot is Nazareth. And so Nazareth is about 10 miles away from Capernaum where Jesus did his ministry. So most of the first part of the gospel happens right here. I have a fantasy of returning to Israel and having like a Nazareth to Capernaum fun run. Okay, but, but that, you know, that hadn't happened yet. So, uh, but, but, we'll, but maybe one day. And so everything Jesus did kind of happened in this small area. And if you read Luke's Gospel carefully, you see that Jesus, when he did travel to Jerusalem, he traveled along the Jordan River Valley. What the Bible doesn't tell us is that Jesus lived in the lowest place on earth. Okay, this is all part of the Great Rift Valley. The Sea of Galilee is 800 feet below sea level up there. By the time you get down here, it's 1,600 feet below sea level. And all this means that it's, it's hot. And if you don't stay near the Jordan River, you'll die. And then if you go up the Jericho Road, which is about right here, you hang a right at Jericho, you go 4,000 feet straight up on a four-lane highway with big trucks. It's sort of like driving up to Sewanee, okay, except, for, except a lot longer. And you're driving, driving, driving. It's a moonscape on either side. It's dusty and it's hot. It's nasty. And finally, I had to ask our guy, a friend, Uval. I said, Uval, how come Jesus didn't travel in the pretty part? Okay, but this is nice over here. This is where everybody wants to live. The farms and the vineyards and all that stuff. It's temperate, okay, because it's much higher elevation. You get a few cool breezes, a little rain. Uval said, you can't travel here. Samaritans live there, and Samaritans will kill you. Now, remember the story Jesus tells of the good Samaritan? Ah, you see, it's not just a story of a good stranger, it's a story of a good enemy. It's a story in response to the question, who is my neighbor? The good Samaritan. It's a story that explodes our idea about who our neighbor might be. Well, look, here's the point. All of this happens from the same distance between Galilee and Jerusalem is the same distance between Birmingham and Prattville. Right? So the Gospels happen in a really, really small place, in a small world. And remember, St. Paul was not from here. Okay, Paulus was from another place. This is his world. This is the world we'll spend time in. This is the world of Paulus. Here is Nazareth and here is Jerusalem. This is the little map I just drew for you. This is where Paul is with his message. This is what the murder of Stephan did. It sent this man haunted out into the world with a new message. Okay, what is that message? This is what we'll conclude with this morning. I said this in my sermon at 8 o'clock. I'll say it again at 10.30. The stories that we tell about ourselves form us. Now, by analogy, there, there are stories that we Americans all tell, right? Uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, American Civil War. Civil Rights Movement. Uh, Things that, things that we tell about ourselves. World War II, the greatest generation. The stories that we Americans tell are the stories that define who we are as a nation. Who are we as a nation? Well, to begin with, we're the good guys. We always hold our leaders into account. If we ever have any debates over foreign policy, there's one thing we don't debate. America's the good guy, right? We're not an empire, right? We, we, we're not Vladimir Putin. We don't, we're not bullies. We don't do that. And so if we ever have any soul searching about who we are, it's only because we know where the are at. These are the stories that we tell about ourselves. Well, in this world, there was a story, an important story, that all of them told to varying degrees. And it was simply this. It was simply this. The story that, that Greek-speaking Romans told about themselves was this. Knowledge is good. The body, it's bad, or you don't have to worry about it. Flesh, what we're made of. It's nothing. We, in other words, we are we are entombed spirits, okay? The longing to get out. Well, what that simply means, and look, different people approach it in different ways, and this is going to be absolutely key to understanding the message of Paul, especially complicated things like Paul's letters to the Romans. Is this what, what they thought was knowledge, beauty, truth, rightness, righteousness, justice. Things of the head, things you think about, these are the things that matter. The body, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. I, look, the hedonism and the, and the pornographic nature of this world that they lived in is, is, is comparable to what, we, what our children are going through right now in the 21st century, in large part because they had become disconnected uh, from their bodies and are not certain that the same thing isn't happening with the digital age today, by the way. I'll say some more about that in just a minute. 
The Hebrews told a different story. You got that story now? That Greek story is not it, head is good, spirit is good, flesh is bad. Okay. The Hebrews told a different story. You can find it in Genesis, right? God made a world, made a beautiful world, and He put us in it, and He made us in His image, and He called us to take care of it. Except for the Hebrews before Jesus, to paraphrase a familiar verse, the Hebrews might say, for God so loved the world, He gave us the law. Right? He gave us the law so that we could learn it and so that we could, we could be right with God and so that we could make the world a place that God would recognize and would recognize us in it. Now, think about our Jewish friends and our Muslim friends and think about how their religion is different than ours. They both have a path and it's hard to follow. But you can do it if you work hard enough. On the day that Paulus, Paulus watched Stephen die, he knew. And this is what he told the world. He knew. You can't. No one's good enough. You can't follow this path. You can't do it. Well, human beings, to paraphrase Paul's letter to the Romans, <laughs> uh, human beings have an infinite capacity to screw up a good thing. Alright, so there you go. I agree. Now, you, you've got the message, okay? This was his message to the world. You can't do it. We're saved by something else. And what is that something else? That something else is grace. Okay, a comedian named, let's talk about the 21st century problem for just a second. A comedian named Louis C.K. had a video that got 8 million hits, and it was about cell phones. I preached on part of it. It was, a, it was actually an interview with Conan O'Brien, and I, part, I preached on the part where Louis C.K. said that the reason why people stay on their phones all the time is because if they were ever put them down, they would get really, really sad. And that had a lot of people watching, and it's, it's kind of a painful truth, right? There's a, there's a sadness in all of us, so we really stay super busy, and super busy becomes a status thing, right? I'm so super busy. I'm sorry I didn't see you. I hadn't seen you all summer. I'm so super busy. Uh, but uh, and so it becomes a status thing. We stay super busy because we're running from the sadness. But that's not the only thing he said about, about the digital age. What he said was that there's a danger to the way that children live on their phones now. He said that not only is there sadness inside of us, they... I couldn't believe this was a comedian. It was, it was really right out of right out of Paulus here. Uh, he said, "There's also a darkness inside of us." And he said, "Children have to learn to look at it full face. They have to look at it and learn." So what will happen is that children children will will experiment with that darkness. They may look at they may look at a neighbor or someone in in school, and they may say something to them like this: "You're ugly. No one likes you." And then when they look in the eyes of that of that other child, they see that they hurt them. And, and, they, and they back off, right? And they don't do it again. They've touched a hot stove. They, they know that something wrong has, has happened. Louis C.K. said that the problem with, with texting now in the, in the digital age is that you can text your ugly and never see the face of the person you've hurt. Can you, can you begin to understand now why we cannot separate our bodies from our hearts, our bodies? from our spirits. Can you see the problem now? The problem that, that, that St. Paul or Paulus addressed in his world is the same problem that we address in ours. No, our bodies do matter. It matters what we do with it. It matters what we do with our neighbors. It matters how we love. It matters how we live. But we also need to know we can't do this on our own. We cannot do this on our own bootstraps. We cannot pull ourselves up. We do have an infinite capacity to screw up, and we have, and we know it. And so we live our lives based on grace, and grace alone. And you set the world on fire, and we'll keep going. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering of friends. Thank you for stories to tell. Thank you for laughter. Thank you for sharing. Thank you this day for Paulus and for his message for us. I pray that you let us hear you. I pray that you form us into a community of love. And I pray that you send us out into the world on fire for you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody.